Hello, and welcome to another edition of B News In Depth. I'm your host, Rich Hosford. Following the wake of the school shooting at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, that left 19 students between the ages of 9 and 11 and two teachers dead, parents across the country had to contemplate the horrifying possibility of a similar incident happening in their children's school. That thought would naturally lead to what is being done in their district to try and prevent such a tragedy or to respond quickly to stop an attack if it were to happen. That is the subject of this month's show. We will take a look at what is being done here in Burlington and in the state to protect our schools, teachers, and of course, students. Measures include security systems in school buildings, officer response training, mental health services, and possible legislation. We will approach this difficult subject in three parts. We will begin with a conversation with Burlington Police Chief Thomas Brown about how officers train to react to active shooters employing an approach of first on scene, first to react that was created in response to the officers waiting for SWAT support during the Columbine shooting that likely resulted in more lives being taken. We will also discuss what security measures can be used to make it difficult for potential perpetrators to enter school buildings and how school leaders can quickly alert police if anyone is acting suspicious. We'll then talk to Superintendent Eric Conti about the district working hand in hand with the police department and matters of security. We'll also talk about how creating a school environment that is welcoming for all students can help reduce the potential of violence. Finally, we'll talk to State Rep Ken Gordon about potential action at the legislative level to make it harder for potentially violent people to acquire weapons and to bolster school security. We will also discuss how Supreme Court rulings might affect gun laws in Massachusetts. We have a lot to get through, so let's get started. Police Chief Thomas Brown to get the law enforcement perspective on this um, important topic. Chief, thanks for taking some time and coming down and talking with us. Thanks for having me, Rich. So, first of all, I just wanted to get your you know your thoughts looking out at you know these different recent incidents we have and just your perspective from a law you know as a law enforcement officer just about you know the state of things in our country right now. Well, I think specifically as you look at these mass shooting events that are happening, um, the first thing that, that comes to mind as just being a parent is, is mm. how scary it is, right? It's a different world than I certainly grew up in. Um, never once going to school did I ever, ever have to worry about not getting there safely or not being protected inside the schools. And then you see what's going on in Buffalo and some of these other places. Um, the world's changed, unfortunately, and we need to change with it. So. Uh, we need to be prepared, but it's 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 shocking and it's sad to see that that these are the times we live in right now. Yeah, and you know, so locally here in in Burlington, I know that there's you know, in order to keep you know all our the, our students safe, that you know, you the police department and the school department kind of you know work hand in hand. Can you talk a little bit about you know how that relationship works? Sure. So we do have a very good relationship with the school department. Uh, we've had that as long back as I can remember. Um, we started to really focus on school safety probably back in about 2010 uh, when we were awarded some grants through the Department of Justice and sent some of our officers to training and um, put a plan together with the school department and the school administration to work hand in hand with them to make sure that we protect the most vulnerable of our population which is our kids and students in school. So uh, we continue to train along with, with them as well as doing our own training to keep our staff up to speed and um, it's, it's been an excellent relationship and that's what it needs to be in order for this to work. Yeah and you mentioned you know having a refocus since 2010 how is sort of like you know police philosophy on you know how to react to these type of situations evolved over time? Well it, it certainly has uh, revolved I mean if you think back to 1999 with um, uh, Columbine which is not the first mass school shooting but certainly the one that um, most people will remember, uh, the, the police waited. Yeah. And what we found was waiting, you know, waiting for SWAT and waiting for some of these other tactical uh, operations assets to come in is not the way to go. When you've got an active shooter situation inside the schools, we need to be that first line defense. So we've gone, uh, we've taken those lessons and we've brought to Burlington our tactics is we're going to get into that school, we're going to get into that business 
uh, because we are the first line of defense and we need to get in there and we need to stop the threat right away. So um, that's how we've evolved and we're still at that point and that's the tact that we take here in Burlington. Right. So it's like first officer on scene tries to get immediately to you know the situation. Correct. Yeah. There's no waiting for SWAT anymore. There, there is no waiting for SWAT. If you have active shooter indicators, uh, the best thing we can do is get in there. Um, I'll take myself as an example. I have kids in the schools. I'm getting in that school, yeah. and you know, um, it's a tough topic to talk about. Certainly, kid, uh, people don't want to be putting their kids onto a bus and having to think about this. And the reality is we want to make sure that we show the community we're prepared and we will handle that for them uh, so they don't have to worry about it, so they have a sense of security when they put their kids on the bus. But at the end of the day, as a parent, I'm going to go into that school. And if somebody is shooting at me, then they're not shooting at a kid. Right. And, and that's, that's the goal. And, you know, so, you know, we're taping this the day after the first of two uh, info sessions by uh, members of your department about this very topic right. and you know and people can watch you know the one from last night that, uh, in full shortly here in, on VCAT. Um, one of the things that got brought up was you know looking at other incidents you know like you mentioned Columbine but you know other ones since and sort of using them as you know ways to sort of help you know inform the, you guys on how you know, best tactics moving forward. Well, just talk about a little bit about you know how you know take other situations and sort of learn from them. Well, so that's that's what you need to do, right? If uh, history is doomed to repeat itself, right? If if we don't if we don't take appropriate action. So what we've done is we've we've gone through um, certain trainings uh, through Alert down in Texas, um, the briefings out in Littleton, Colorado, and Columbine, and we have uh, staff on the department that that in fact study these type of incidents so that we can bring the best practices forward and make sure that our training is responding to the events that are going on. So if you look at any of these mass shooting events and you, and you get down into the weeds on what happened, there are some scientific conclusions that come out um, from these shootings and then we take those conclusions and we bring them forward into our training. So I'll give you as an example, mm -hmm. um, out of all the mass shootings, and I'll, and I'll stay specifically on schools for right now, there have only been, I believe, three times where somebody has been able to penetrate a closed door. So one of the things that we encourage for the, uh, through the standard response protocol, which is the protocol we use for school safety, and that can be used in the community as well through businesses, is we want the, the doors to be shut. God forbid something like this happens, shut the door, shut off the lights, and hide in that room. And your chances increase exponentially that somebody isn't going to try to get into that room. So um, that's data-driven. That's coming right out of some of these briefings that, um, that we've studied. So we try to do that, and we're constantly looking to evolve and bring in best practices. And that's something that, you know, going back to, you know, here in Burlington and we're in the partnership with the, with the school department. That's something you work with individual teachers on, is correct? Correct. We, we work with uh, individual teachers. As, as you know, we have Detective Shepard, who's assigned as a full-time school resource officer uh, here at the high school, and then Officer Vito Costa is assigned full-time in the middle school. Um, they're available to host these trainings for individual teachers, and we also hold the uh, training. My staff will go in and train, train the school community at large. Um, and they're all trained on the school on the um, standard response protocol. And if you go into any classroom in Burlington, you're going to see those posters up on the wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we actually had did a, a story about that a couple of years ago too, so people can yeah. find that and kind of get the details. Right. But it is pretty straightforward, I would right. say. Um, so sticking with here in town, you know, I know there have been certain things that have been put in place uh, in order to make response times faster, um, like alert systems at the school. Um, can just sort of, without getting into any details, obviously that would make any uh, compromise any security. Just sort of let people know what is in place right now. Sure. So we have uh, in certain buildings, um, and they're not just limited to the schools. We have what's mm -hmm. called a, a wave system, and that wave system is basically an emergency alert button that's um, strategically placed in certain areas of these buildings, where the user all they have to do is hit that button. And what happens is once they hit that button an alert will actually come over every single police department radio, including the dispatch center. And right away, <clears throat> right over our frequency, you're going to hear the location 
um, the room or area inside that building uh, that there's an emergency situation. And all of our officers, from myself all the way down, are trained to immediately to begin to respond to that area. What that does is cuts down on tremendous time on the radio. Mm -hmm. um, you are taking it, you are taking out of the equation a 911 operator who is trying to uh, gain the information from a caller who's obviously going to be extremely stressed out. You can imagine what that call would sound like if it's coming over a phone line. Absolutely. Um, that takes that out of there. So we may gain a minute to a minute and 30 seconds, right, uh, getting to that response. And as we know, seconds save lives. Yeah, and, and interestingly, you know, as was brought up last night, uh, you have a good example that, you know, the, the system works pretty well. Can you talk we, about the false alarm that happened? We do. So we had a false alarm at the Memorial School. I don't remember exactly when it was. Uh, within the past year, I believe, uh, or year and a half, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm actually, time, time starts to get away. Yeah, from. especially during But what happened COVID. was our day shift was just coming on. It was about 8, 10 in the morning. And somebody at the Memorial inadvertently, by accident, hit that, hit that button. And uh, within 48 seconds, we had officers at the door. Within less than a minute, we had the first officer in the, in the building, or within about a minute, in the building. And within a minute, 30 seconds, we had two more officers on the other end of the school, the opposite end of the, uh, the main hallway in Memorial, ready to go in. So all total, we probably had about 13 or 14 responders within two minutes. But the, but the key to that is within 48 seconds, our first arriving officers were on scene. And the question came up last night at the forum, well, you must have had some cruisers in the area. Um, the closest cruiser was coming out of the police station parking lot at the time. Right. I was actually the third one down there, and I came out from my office. So I heard it in my office and was able to get out into my cruiser and, and get down there within 48 to 55 seconds. That's an impressive time. Right. <laughs> So again, it cuts out that 911 call. Um, you know, I can't imagine a more um, devastating event than something like this. And you can imagine the stress of the person. I don't care who it is that's making that call. Um, it, it takes a lot for a 911 operator to get that information out of a person uh, when they're not that excited. <clears throat> so um, again, seconds save lives. And this wave system really, really is instrumental in our response. Excellent. And, you know, just so people have an understanding, like when you guys arrive at a school, you can, you can get in it pretty quickly. Well, we, ha we certainly have tools that are going to help us get in. Um, I won't, you know, you saw some of the breaching kits that uh, right. were on display last night. Each cruiser has one of those. Uh, we also have um, a key card system that we can utilize. Uh, so we're going to bring every tool to bear to get into that school. Um, we drill on it constantly. Officers know during their response that immediately they're to bring out, uh, we each, all the cruisers are equipped with rifles. They obviously have their firearm on them. Um, and when they get out of that cruiser, they know, grab that breaching kit, bring it up to the door, and let's go, we're, you know, we're ready for business. If we have to breach a door or a window, we're gonna be able to do it. Right. And, you know, I guess one of the things is when you, since you have all this equipment and you have, you know, the funds to do all this training, it seems like there's good support from the community, town meeting, you know, as far as like giving you what you need to protect the kids. There is excellent support here and, and there always has been. I mean, um, Chief Kent, when he first came into the department, he reallocated some of the, um, some of the budget towards training. So now we have a, an extremely high focus on training and it's training that's relevant. It's, it's this type of thing that we need to train on constantly. Um, and as part of that, we're able to, because of that training and what we're bringing back to the town, we can justify the equipment. It's, um, it's, it's equipment that hopefully we never need, but if you need it, it's urgent and we need it now. And the town and the town administration, the select board town meeting have all been extremely um, supportive and helpful. And that goes, I'm sure, for the school committee as well on the school side, because um, we've never run into any roadblocks when it comes to when it comes to safety of the kids. And I know part of you know the discussion was that with all the training, it's not just the, getting the skills down, it's getting the right mindset. Um, just talk about what you know, because obviously something happens and everybody you know, would hope that they would you know, be the hero and rise to the occasion, but you know, when things are actually very stressful and you know, it seems like most people would freeze unless they had that sort of you know, background of you know, drilling it. Um, just you know, talk about the importance of training and kind of getting, you know, the right sort of, you know, 
mindset to, right. to, so, to handle so, the situation. Right, so mindset is exactly what it is. So I, I'm very proud to say we have the best training unit uh, in the state. There's, there's no doubt in my mind. Um, it's run by Captain Hannafin and Lieutenant Tim McDonough. Um, and Lieutenant Glenn Mills is in charge of our overall training. Um, we just have excellent resources and excellent people. And the very first thing we do is we acknowledge that if we're going to bring this training to bear, you have to have the right mindset to get something out of this training. So we are constantly drilling as best we can to put into play lifelike scenarios uh, for all of our training scenarios. So if it's we bring you up on a day shift and put you onto the simulator, which we have in the mezzanine of the station, to our routine firearms training, to active shooter drills, we are constantly drilling and, and putting people in the mindset that, hey, if you ever see a situation like this, where is your brain at the time? What is your brain going through when that call comes over the radio? What are you doing mentally to prepare as you're responding? So whether it's we're watching a video in roll call in an active shooter situation, or we're actually going through our own practical skills, we are constantly beginning by priming that pump of get your, get your brain in the right spot. And where it, where it comes to Bear Ridge, quite honestly, was that, that call at Memorial. Um, Thirteen of us were down there within two minutes. Right. And, and we thought it was real. There was, there was no indication at all that that was a false alarm. And, and 13 to 15 of us showed up within two to three minutes. Yeah, almost sort of a serendipitous training session right there. Correct. You know? And I know that you also, it was mentioned that you'll do response times, you know, practice them at night when the school. We do, we do, or? because we want to, number one, there's less traffic on the road. Um, when, whenever we do the drills, we're not running with lights and siren to them, uh, because you obviously you don't want to get hurt when you know it's a drill. You don't want to get hurt anyways. Right. But we also practice off hours so that the officers who aren't traditionally on a day shift will be able to hear the wave system. They'll be able to hear what the drill sounds like. They'll be able to respond. They'll practice getting in and out of the cruiser with their equipment. They'll practice um, with their key card, making sure that they're able to gain access to the, to the school or the building. Um, so it puts all of us into that mindset that these drills could happen at any time, and you've got to be ready. Right. Um, just trying to think of what we haven't covered yet. Uh, we've covered a lot of the bases. Um, yeah, let's see. Anything you know that was sort of part of the discussion last night that we really well, wanted to make sure that residents uh, you know, are aware of? There is, and I think one of the biggest pieces of this, and you'll remember from last night it came up towards the end, is you know, people want to, want to profile the, the people who are involved as shooters, right? Um, well, I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist. I don't know what goes through these individuals' minds, but I do know this. Um, in every one of these shooting events, after the event, people have come out and said, well, there were some indicators. He or she said this. Uh, they were acting strangely or differently than they normally were. This comes back to the, to the adage, if you see something, say something. If we don't know about it, there's not much we can do about it. But there are so many resources within town, from your teachers and your guidance staff to your school administrators uh, to mental health professionals. We have a full-time clinician on the police department now. Um, those people are trained to to help somebody that may be in crisis. So if somebody sees that, who knows, maybe, maybe we head one of these off just by getting the person help. So yeah. that's a big part of this. The other part of it is on the security issues. If you're walking through a school, you happen to be a parent or you're driving by, dropping your child off, and you see a door that's open, bring it to the attention of the school. The doors should be, should be closed. And we have our officers go down on what we call directed patrols to all the schools at different times. They walk around the schools, they check the doors, they make sure that the physical security is in place. Because like I said, if, if the door is locked, your chances exponentially are better that somebody isn't going to penetrate it. So all of these things go part and parcel, but if you see something, say something. And if somebody does say something, I know this is a big discussion nationally right now as far as like, you know, gun safety reform, but you know, here in Massachusetts, if, you know, if somebody comes to you and says, you know, I'm worried about my son or my you know, cousin or whatever, um, what would be the protocol that you would follow? So if they came to us specifically and it, and it wasn't a criminal um, type of thing, but it's a community caretaking issue, yeah. what we would do is immediately refer it to our clinician, Karen DiRienzo, mm -hmm. and Karen has so many outside resources that she can use as well. She could get in touch with the schools, maybe the school gets involved, maybe youth and families from the town, Christine Shruhan's office gets involved. 
but we'll put that person on the right track to get the help they need. Okay. Um, just got a couple of last things. I know you, one of the things you know that Burlington is part of is NEMLEC. Right. You know, for a situation that wouldn't be the the immediate response, but you know, something a little bit uh, more drawn out. Just talk about you know how that sort of cooperation works, and and then we can touch on the example of the uh, the infamous. Mall umbrella. Gunbrella, yeah. Yeah, gunbrella. Yep. So we've been a member of NEMLEC for as long as I can remember. And what NEMLEC does is it's it's obviously it's a um, law enforcement council made up of of multiple cities and towns in the northeast portion of Massachusetts. And what it does is it, it's a cooperative law enforcement effort that brings assets and personnel to bear uh, in the event of a major incident, uh, whether that incident be one of violence or potential violence. Or, barricaded subject or a shooting incident or even a lost child like God forbid what happened in Lowell recently. Yeah. Uh, we have those assets to bear because Burlington, if, if I had every officer on, that's 68 of us. Uh, some of these events you need a lot more people than that as you can imagine between crowd control and search and rescue and some of these other incidents that go on and NEMLEC gives us immediate access to those assets. What we give back to NEMLEC is we have personnel assigned to both the SWAT team the regional response team, we have some on the mountain bikes, the drone unit, et cetera, K-9. Uh, when an incident happens in their jurisdiction, our personnel from Burlington go and help them. So it's a, it's a mutual aid cooperative that, that just allows us to bring multiple assets to bear to handle any type of incident. Right, and that was on display during the, uh, when somebody, when it was reported that somebody had a gun at the mall. It was quite the response, I remember. I was, I was there covering it after Correct. the call came out. And, very uh, large presence of law enforcement there. Right, and the, ni and the nice thing about NEMLEC is usually within about a half hour of any activation, those, uh, those assets are starting to pour in, whether it's some of the vehicles, uh, the personnel, the different team members, canines, et cetera. Uh, usually within 30 minutes you're getting them. And the nice thing is, is we have many of our personnel in Burlington trained up to those levels, so they're gonna be an immediate response. Right, all right, I think we kind of covered all the all the bases, all the questions. I just want to end with, you know, and you've touched on this before, but just the reassurance to the community that, you know, these are things that the police department not only takes seriously, but puts a lot of time and effort into. Yeah, so again, you know, I, I always try to look at it through the parent lens, right? As right. a parent, I don't want to have to worry about putting my, putting my daughter on the bus to get to uh, Marshall Simons and have to worry about her safety, right? No parent should have to do that. But as the police chief and as a police officer, I do worry about that. And what we do in response to that worry is we train. And we train up and we're constantly bringing in those best practices. We drill on it repeatedly. So I want to take the burden of that worry. All the officers here take the burden of that worry. So that, God forbid, it ever happens, we're ready. And parents can go about doing what a parent should be doing, which least of, least of which is worrying about their child's safety in the school. Right. And that goes as well for the, for the teachers and staff too. They shouldn't have to be worried about that. No, so. got to focus on learning. Right, exactly. Yeah. All right, well, very good. Yeah. I appreciate you taking the time and for all the, you know, the work that you do over there to keep everybody safe. Well, thank you, Rich. I appreciate it. We go now to my conversation with Superintendent Eric Conti on the relationship between the district and the police department. We will also talk about the role of mental health support and how the right student environment can help keep everybody safe. I'm joined by Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Eric Conti, to get the uh, school administrative perspective on this important issue. Eric, thanks for taking some time. Sure, Rich. So just first of all, you know, when something like Uvalde, Texas happens, what sort of like ripple effects does that have among, with, to, you know, among other like school leaders? How does it sort of impact what, how you think about things? Oh, it makes just the nightmare seem real. I mean, that's the hard part is um, it's something that's unimaginable that you have to plan for that you hope to never experience and to see it actually happen is is horrific so um, um, so I guess that's that's what I would say it, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's it's very impactful yeah I mean and, and you know it is like the reason that we wanted to put the show together because it was all of a sudden something that we were thinking about too um, yeah, I think everybody across the country was. Mm -hmm. um, now you said you know something that you try to prepare for, and I know that you know in so doing, you the school district works, you know, closely with the 
police department. Can uh -huh. you talk about that relationship and how it works? Again, I think the relationship is, is longstanding. I think the relationship is positive. I think that they have a lot of expertise that we need to take advantage of in these particular situations. I think they help make uh, those decisions and help us prepare uh, as best we can. Um, so that's kind of what I would say. The, the adoption of our standard response protocol was done in collaboration with the uh, Burlington Police Department, and that's creating a common language for us to um, deal with these situations. And um, I think they've even gone so far as to have that common language practiced across the community, not just with schools. Um, and then other, other security decisions that, that, that we make. Um, and I think they've been an incredible partner um, in terms of um, trying to prepare as best we can for um, you know the the scenario that doesn't seem real but then all of a sudden becomes real right right and what kind of I mean I don't obviously don't want to get into anything that would compromise security but I know that there have been certain capital projects that have looked to address you know making the buildings more secure <laughs> uh, just to you know give parents some reassurance about you know what sort of things are out there um, can you highlight a couple of them? Um, sure. I, again, I, I think the um, what I would say is to to convey reassurance is the town has supported financially the requests that we've made. I think those requests haven't come from people like me. They've come from uh, working with the police department and mm -hmm. for for them to make suggestions. And then we've implemented uh, the suggestions that we've made. And that can go anything from, you know from communication where we have uh, better radios than we had. Uh, before the ability to communicate across town, I think um, the you know the police have been um, you know involved in in that, making sure our our door locks are um, upgraded and functioning. Um, so things like that as we've we've worked to make sure that we've maintained. We have again some older buildings, some newer buildings. I think right. we've uh, looked to even in our older buildings. So a building like Fox Hill, we've changed the entrance to create a secure vestibule so uh, we've tried to add some uh, security that is a feature in newer buildings to our older buildings so um, and recently this past town meeting we had a sort of an identification when people come into the building for them to get their license scanned and to have a picture so we're trying to make sure that um, we're keeping better track of who's in the building and and um, and so um, to try to minimize as you know everything that we can, um, and when possible, or where you know there there are uh, drills that we go through, um, which um, are important, and we all remember the fire drills we had when we were in school, and, yes. and they're sort of similar to that, where we're just practicing moving large numbers of of kids and staff, um, you know, or moving them around the building, or having them uh, stay in place, and um, making sure that we're we are practicing um, those type of uh, those type of situations, um, Rich. But all those are only one aspect of security. Yeah. Um, and I think that um, from my perspective, um, they're incredibly important. But um, from the day to day perspective, um, I think one of the most in, you know important security measures we have are no fees for athletics, no fees for performing arts. Um, you want kids engaged in school. You want them to have healthy relationships with adults and with their peers. You want to have those opportunities. Um, you don't want students to feel anonymous. You want them to feel like they belong. Um, those are the efforts that we really can focus on as a, as a school department. And um, for many situations, um, the, um, if it's a student-involved incident, um, the students have uh, communicated to friends or on social media or online that um, they've sort of given a warning that this was happening and so um, we're trying to uh, again get to know our kids um, and to I think that's a huge part of how we try to deal with this proactively um, yes we have to prepare for the worst case scenario but um, in terms of our day-to-day -day function um, knowing our kids having those relationships uh, having um, again talented teachers principals um, are I think are really the first line of, of I guess defense from from uh, for lack of a better word is is how I would see we're we're really trying to approach this. 
Yeah, so if I understand you, it's both creating an atmosphere or a school environment where people will feel connected with each other and you know not have that sort of maybe trigger that sets them off. And also, I'm guessing, because I know that there have been a couple incidents where somebody posted something usually kind of vaguely threatening online and other probably other students were the ones that noticed it and felt comfortable enough to come to a teacher or other you know, principal or something. Exactly, and we need to reward the students for doing the right thing, and then we need to work with the kids um, who uh, posted that inappropriate thing. Honestly, uh, the stakes in today's world are so, are so high, we have to do a lot of training with our students as well. Um, um, I didn't have the, the internet or a cell phone with a camera when I was growing up, and um, you know, a, a stupid comment can carry with someone for a, for a long, very long period of time. So we need to do sort of education, you know, education there, there as well. Um, but those, again, relationships from my perspective are still critical in, in how, we, how we make sure that students are um, navigating school in a healthy way. Um, we're paying much more attention to student mental health uh, recently and really trying to make sure students have uh, support um, with you know, anxiety, with any other uh, dysregulation that they, that they may have. So again, for us to try to be as proactive as we can, um, we can't avoid everything, but we have to also address what's in our control, and what's in our control is what happens during the school day. Um, you know, we don't have any control over all the other conversations that are, that are happening sort of politically or anything else, and I think for us to focus too much on those um, doesn't help our students uh, day to day. Right. Now, uh, you mentioned, you know, what we're doing with student mental health, and I know this is slightly different than going back to what we were originally talking about, but, you know, when you're doing things like the drills with students, is there a way to sort of convey to, especially I'm thinking the younger students, like the importance of, you know, completing the drill successfully but not making school seem like a scary place to be? Well, I think our teachers are excellent at that, and, and they always try to explain things in age-appropriate ways. So, um, you know, why am I in the classroom with the door locked? You could say, what if a, a turkey comes in the building from outside? I mean, it, it's, it's a, um, I think the students have a hard time not seeing the information that's out there in the world. Yes. Um, so I think they ask questions, but I also think our teachers are very talented in sort of framing the drills and framing everything from a, again, in an age appropriate way. And if anyone is really impacted, any student is really impacted, you know, by that, they would seek support and, and make sure they talk through that and communicate with the family. And um, again, I think it's a communication piece, but again, I think our, our teachers handle that well. And also, I know that, you know, you have in the past posted resources for parents, like, you know, if their children are watching the news with them or, you know, it's going to be out there. Uh, you know, the way the, to sort of get, give them a sort of a better understanding of how to maybe approach those conversations. Yeah, and again, that's where we have, uh, it's great to have district expertise. I think a lot of the letter that we sent out after Uvalde was written by our director of mental health, uh, Chrissy Concession. So she put some resources on there for parents and how to talk to your kids about these events. Um, and people can utilize those resources or not. Maybe every family has a way that they want to talk about this. but. Um, there are some instances where students react to those situations. The older kids, we need to provide them a space maybe to um, reflect or decompress about that. And there may be appropriate with some of the younger kids where it's not addressed at all. Maybe they're even unaware of it, and that's, and that's okay. So um, I think we try to, again, approach this differently across the board, um, but also provide as many resources as we can uh, for parents uh, to, to think about that. I mean, it's just a... Um, it's something, again, we have to prepare for, but it's, it's really hard to think about. Right. Yeah. And, I mean, my sister is a school teacher as well, and she says that, you know, some of the drills that they've done have just been, you know, very sobering for her and, you know, made her sort of a little uneasy, <laughs> as I think they're somewhat intended to, but not necessarily the goal. Yeah, no, not the goal, but uh, I think making sure communication is clear, making sure, again, we can move people. I think um, the less thinking people have to do in those situations, the, you know, the better. Um, and um, I think the Burlington Police have been great about what to prioritize, um, what steps to take, and um, again, the feedback that they provide us um, is, is invaluable. So, so again, it's a real partnership. and. Um, 
I know Chief Brown is you know sitting here because I've I've talked to him a, a lot, and I know even Chief Kent prior to him. This is a huge priority for them. I think uh, many of our um, our officers uh, have children in the schools. Um, you know, we're all invested in in creating the safest environments we we can. Um, Obviously, my priority is is safety first because it that's how learning can take place, and, right. and the police are um, safety first because safety is first, and and they're the ones whose lives will be. Um, I mean, those are the ones guys who are coming in and women who are coming in to uh, to protect our students, so yeah. and our teachers and and everybody who's in the building. Well, it is comforting, I think, to hear that you know there is such a good working relationship between between the two you know departments, and uh, you know we are here at the end of. This school year, and you know, we're had a, I think everybody had a, a safe experience. Obviously, the concern was more COVID than anything, but um, yeah. Maybe. But but again, be it a pandemic, be it uh, uh, school violence, uh, we still have to make sure that we're listening to everybody, and, and all kids feel the same way, and that we're getting feedback and and responding to that you know to that feedback. So, um, and it may be that. Um, the majority of kids feel safe, but if there's a small minority, we always need to make sure that we're our our goal is always that everyone uh, feels safe, and that uh, again that and that includes the adults in the buildings in the in the buildings too. So, um, so I again, what's in our control, we try to control. What's out of our control, we try to prepare for. And I and I think, um, um, as I said, with the pandemic. Um, None of us have training in public health, per se. Uh, none of us really have training in public safety. But uh, again, having great partners like the Board of Health and great partners in public safety like the Burlington Police Force uh, um, and working together uh, allows us to try to you know, create a, the safest environment that we can. Absolutely. All right. Well. I will let you get on to start your summer vacation. Oh, I don't get a summer vacation, yeah, but I'm so, I'm so excited for, uh, again, everyone's worked incredibly hard. I think um, I saw a lot of smiles today. Um, so we're, it's, it's been, a, it's been almost, it feels like two or three years wrapped up within this one year because sure. uh, we've had conversations every month and uh, the months have all been very different. But um, I'm hoping that um, we'll have a, a very good summer break and then um, the opening of, of school will feel uh, much more typical. I think we'll, all, we'll have new skills, but I think um, I'm hoping that we'll return um, to uh, a much more familiar setting. Yes, that would be good for yeah, everybody. for everybody. All right, well, thank you very much for taking the time. Thanks, Rich. Finally, we go to my interview with State Rep Ken Gordon about positive legislative steps that could be taken to increase school security and how changes on the federal level could impact things here in Massachusetts. I'm now joined by State Rep Ken Gordon to talk about these issues on a state level and get his perspective on what you know, could possibly be in the pipeline uh, as far as state uh, rules go. Ken, thanks for coming in and joining me today. Thanks for having me, Rich. I appreciate it. Thanks for the conversation. So I just kind of want to start a little broad. You know, when you look at and you see all the, you know, these different incidences like Uvalde and Buffalo and, I mean, there's too many really to name. Just, like, as a lawmaker, what, what sort of, like, your just thoughts overall of, like, the situation that we're in? Well, uh, you may, may be aware of this, but when I was first elected, uh, uh, in 2012, we uh, just before taking office in December, we um, experienced the Sandy Hook mass mm -hmm. murder. So one of the first issues that I was faced with as a legislature was gun violence protection in our schools. Uh, and in the legislature, we passed a series of laws that uh, I think were designed in a balanced way to look at guns on our streets and to look at whether guns that are really intended for use in war uh, as weapons of war are, uh, are necessary in, in, right. in our streets by private people and, 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 other, uh, and, and other issues that come about. And so we've been looking and looking again and revising our views on the rights of people to feel safe on our streets and in our schools and in our malls and movie theaters and, you know, and on it goes to make sure that we're balancing those rights. And so we do have, statistically speaking, one of the two safest states in the nation, uh, our, uh, Massachusetts and Hawaii, uh, are, uh, it have that position. Mm -hmm. Hawaii, though, is an island. Uh, Massachusetts experiences guns that come up, weapons that come over from other states, uh, New Hampshire, Maine, 
New York. Um, Hawaii doesn't have that challenge. Right. And so uh, we, we do have, statistically speaking, uh, one of the safest states to live in in the country. And we're going to continue to look at our laws to make sure that that continues to be the case. Now, like you just said, comparatively, you know, we have some of the stricter gun laws in the in the country. But just taking it on the, on their own, how do, how do you rate sort of where Massachusetts stands as far as you know balancing the you know gun rights versus gun safety? Yeah. So what we do is we and balance is the right word, Rich. You use a good because people have a right to uh, through the Second Amendment to access um, certain guns in Massachusetts, and we respect that. People also have, I think, a natural right in Massachusetts to feel safe, so that when kids go to school, they don't see armed, you know, armed people in their classrooms or, 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 or thereabouts, um, it, reminding them of any threat of danger, because they should feel that this is you know, a place mm. they go to learn. Right. Uh, and so we, we want to continue to have that balance. And so one example of that in the law that we passed Again, it was about about ten years ago. Is the rights of people to conceal carry, or the rights of people to have long weapons? Um, we gave a lot of discretion to the uh, chiefs of police, the municipal police chiefs, because they know the people that are coming in front of them. They they talk to them. They make the decision. On top of that, we also give an appeal right to the applicant in case the applicant is denied a license um, and. Because of fairness, we balance who has to who has the burden of proof, meaning who has to prove that the chief was right or wrong, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, depending on the situation. So we try to look at this as a balanced approach, looking at somebody's rights to possess a firearm and somebody's rights to feel safe. Yeah, and I guess maybe we should back up a little bit because I don't know if everybody is sort of aware of how it works here in the state. You know, if you want to. You know, have a permit. You must go to your. It's a, it is like you just said, the local chief of police that sort of like has the first decision. Yeah. So there are two. And there are two permits that are really in play. One would be a license to carry, and and one would deal with a longer uh, a federal ID to carry a a, a long weapon. Mm -hmm. And so yes, you would go to your local police chief. You'd fill out the application, and uh, and an interview, and it would be up to that local police officer as to your if you're a person that should have that, that license, especially when it comes to concealed carry. And that's the bigger issue, really, because you know, that's a person that wants to have a weapon in a way that is not visible right. uh, to, to, to someone else. Um, that's the local police chief that might know, for example, if there were incidents of domestic abuse at a particular home uh, that they've sent police out to see. Um, and so we want to give some discretion, some authority to that local police chief to make these decisions. So that's what you do. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you know, you talked about some, some of the legislation that was passed you know, in the wake of Sandy Hook. Is there anything um, currently in the works that is being discussed? Yeah, so there's, there's an issue that's really been a, a concern of mine for, for, some, for a few years now, and I think uh, that it's got some momentum to be addressed during this session, and it's something called ghost guns. We call ghost guns, which is that we now have the technology so that people who otherwise couldn't obtain a gun legally can manufacture parts to guns on a 3D printer, mm -hmm. or can obtain parts to guns, for example, through a mail order, and then put them together. But it's the 3D printer, really, that directly is, is an issue, because you can make a gun out of plastic in that way that can, is actually serviceable. There's no serial number, it's untraceable. So we're looking at restricting that, uh, passing laws that deal with the use of ghost guns, really. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's, that's there. I mean, we, we recently dealt with red flag uh, laws. That's where you know, someone, it, for at least some temporary part of their life, somebody sees, has a gun, somebody's in fear and says, I don't think that person's in a place that they, um, that they may be with their gun, that they may possess a threat to themselves or to others, and they go to see a judge and say, I think there's a problem here. We just saw on the federal level that this compromise that's right, yeah, going through, about that. yeah, that's going through, would give discretion to the states to pass these red flag laws. We already have one in Massachusetts, and we did that more recently than, than 10 years ago, and that was a few years ago. So we continue to assess um, our laws, and another is bump stocks. Is, turning a weapon that's a semi-automatic weapon that you still have to pull the trigger each time to an 
uh, a rapid fire weapon, um, we'd be in that. Yeah. We, I mean, we just don't see the need for that on our streets. We definitely see the need for that in a war, but we don't see the need for that from a private person on our streets. Right. And that became an issue, I think, after the Las Vegas shooting, because Correct. that was something that I think that the so, or the shooter there was was using, or yeah, it came out. Yeah. No, no, I don't. I'm sorry. I just. Want to, I'm not saying that there isn't a threat and that there isn't something to worry about here in Massachusetts, because the majority of guns that are used to commit a crime in Massachusetts come over the border from another state. Right. And when we can't stop cars when they're coming from from another state into Massachusetts, so you know that it's an issue, but it's an issue that's hard to legislate. Yeah, because if every state you know has different rules, I mean, like you said, people are free to move around. I mean, I guess Hawaii is lucky that way. That's what I mean by saying that that's why that's <laughs> one of the, the other safest state because it's an island. Right. Uh, but, but for us, yeah, we also have to deal with what comes to us. So we can require that if these weapons are discovered and they're not registered or things like that, that we have, but that's almost after the fact. It's difficult to keep up with that. Now you mentioned, you know, the, the sort of the pending legislation or upcoming possible legislation at the federal level. Um, is there anything else that, you know, that has come out from those talks that would actually uh, make any changes here in Massachusetts? And so I know, like you said, you know, the red flag law, we already have that. Is there anything else that they're talking about that would sort of go beyond what we have right now? Basically what they're talking about uh, that I see out of the uh, out of the Senate now are things that we already do yeah. have. I mean, there's more funding for things, and that would be great. But as far as the direct protections from gun violence, we have those in place. And so, you know, I fear that what we see from the Senate is a, our political talking points. Um, uh, people looking, people can senators concerned that they see that here among people, among residents of of the of the country. There are so many incidents of mass shootings almost every day, like you said. You yeah. can just list them. That the Senate has to do something. Um, you know, they just the, the people are going to answer at the ballot box. And what my fear is is that they're doing almost just enough to have an argument going in to uh, to the election right. in November. And you know, here in Massachusetts in the state legislature, that's not our motivation. We've we've acted to keep people safe all along the way. Now, keeping on the topic of, you know, what could changes at the federal level, you know, that was more gun control being discussed or, you know, somewhat more gun control being discussed, but there's also um, the possibility that Supreme, Supreme Court cases, or especially one right now from New York with concealed carry could sort of maybe go take things in the opposite direction. What's the concern there? Well, correct. So this is, the Supreme Court has a case, and it should be decided in the next couple of weeks, yeah. uh, dealing with New York's 100-plus-year-old concealed carry law, which says that if you want a license to carry a concealed weapon, you at least have to have a reason that can be considered by the licensing authority, right, by the person giving the license. And, right. and the Supreme Court has questioned that, saying, well, we don't know why you'd have to give a reason. The concern so that would be overturned. And then we in Massachusetts would be looking at our laws to make sure that whatever laws we have that deal with, again, the right of somebody to have a weapon, that's fine, but to make sure that we, uh, under our state constitution or otherwise, are also protecting our residents from threats of violence through guns or protecting people themselves because the incidence of suicide that results in a death by the use of a gun is way more significant than using any other way. So it also possesses a threat to themselves right. you know, in that way. And, it, and, it's, and it's a real concern because you've got the U.S. Supreme Court telling a state that, look, your legislature 100 years ago passed uh, you know, a framework of legislation dealing with this, and we now think you don't have the right to do that. We know more than your state's legislature. So it's a, it's a pretty active role and it will affect other states significantly. Right, and I think you know, there's also a concern that more things like that could come by. I think that is a strategy among gun lobbyists is to sort of have these cases come up and get before the Supreme Court and then you know, impact the entire country. Yeah, in this and in other ways too. Is, you know, you've got a Supreme Court, that's, you know, we could go down that, that road, yeah. that topic, but yes, you've got justices that you know, 
that, that get interviewed in a hearing, in a public hearing, and it's all, we, we have a record of it when it deals with Supreme Court precedent and following Supreme Court precedent and then acting in a different way. Yeah, and, you know, I think everyone's aware it's a pretty conservative group of justices right now, and I think there's a lot of activists that are trying to take advantage of that. You know, abortion, I think, will probably be a big issue. I know that's not our topic of, of our conversation today, but it's just an example of how, you know, changes at the federal level can really impact the states, yeah. even if the state legislatures and the, or the citizens of that state don't really uh, agree with it, yeah. agree with their decisions. Right, and a few weeks from the time that we're doing this interview, we'll have a lot to talk about on those issues as the Supreme Court decisions come out. Right. Um, you know, so we talked a lot about guns, but, you know, the, I, the whole, you know, school security thing has got, you know, other components to it. There are other ways to, you know, increase funding to help you know, with, you know, security systems, door locks, you know, alert systems. Any, anything that you're seeing that could be done on the state level to kind of help local municipalities, you know, sort of bolster how they uh, approach school security? Yeah, well, we've been responding to the needs of the municipalities all along, and we'll continue to do that through our state budget, through federal funding, through the American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA, mm -hmm. um, in that way. And so not the needs of a school in one municipality may be different than another, but we certainly are there to provide funding, you know, when, when, uh, when, when we see the needs of these municipalities coming forward. Yeah, so is any, but nothing specifically on the table right now? Well, again, it's, it's an overall framework that's been on the table, right. but it's the one that we've been working through all along. Gotcha. All right. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, so I mean, as to your the school topic, and I'll just I'll elaborate a little bit. Yeah. Our schools are run by the municipalities, and so I think that you'll have Superintendent Conti in, in one of yeah. your interviews. And we would you know, prefer not to tell the municipalities, the schools, what to do directly, you know, as we respect the authority of the municipality to make those decisions. We're just here to help with funding right. of, the, of that strategy. Yeah, and I know that in, here in Burlington, you know, there has been updates to like, you know, the, the way that people are allowed to enter and exit the schools. They have a whole system of like, you know, sort of alerts that go right to the police and we'll get into all of that with uh, Chief Brown and Superintendent Conti, so. Right. Um, so I guess that's, you know, most of the questions that I had, unless there's sort of, you know, any other aspect that you think, you know, people should be aware of. No, Rich, I, I think, I appreciate that you're looking into these issues because people have a right, uh, and, and they really should, just be kept up to date on, on what we're doing on, things that are in the news that are concerning people. People want to be safe. Uh, people want to know that we respect their rights, and we do. But, you know, we have these areas where people's rights are in conflict with each other. You know, someone's rights to feel safe, someone's rights to say, I have a Second Amendment right to carry a weapon. That's true, we don't, we don't argue with that. Right. You, you do, people do have that right. But we have to look at the framework on how, you know, how, how you carry out that right and how we can protect people at the same time. Yeah, because definitely we see, you know, when it's just no regulations that where it can lead to because we are one of the few countries that has this sort of level of gun violence and it's sort of uh, difficult sort of to wrap your head around. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I just had a conversation with the Chairman Mike Day, the Chairman of the Judiciary, and he pointed out an example, if you look at it in the extreme, is that I don't think anyone would argue that we don't have a right to have a tank in your driveway yeah, right. and drive it around town, right? So where do you draw the line? Obviously, that's on the other side of the line. And so we know there's a line right. that wouldn't be protected on uh, constitutionally. Where do you draw it? And I think that's a conversation that in Massachusetts we have. And I think that most of our residents understand that that's a conversation to have. Where do you draw that line? Some people are going to draw one place, some people another. And we'll make that decision once we hear, and we've made that decision after listening to all voices in the in the in the conversation right excellent well thank you very much for taking some time and you know sharing your, your thoughts and expertise on the on this issue and uh you know appreciate you coming in thank you rich appreciate it so there you have it an in-depth look at how local leaders and police schools and state politics are working to help ensure the safety of all schools teachers and students it's a difficult topic to talk about, but it is a conversation that's important to have to help ensure all parents that work is being done to try and protect their children. 
I'd like to thank my guests, Burlington Police Chief Thomas Brown, Burlington Superintendent of Schools Eric Conti, and State Representative Kim Gordon. I'd also like to thank all of you for watching. We'll be back with another edition of B News In Depth next month, so stay tuned.